Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you very much for coming to this evening, uh, <coughs> this evening's event. This is the 2017 University of Edinburgh uh, Gifford Lecture Series. My name is Jo Shaw. I hold the Salveson Chair of European Institutions in the School of Law at the University of Edinburgh, and I also direct the uh, Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities, and I'm a member of the uh, Gifford Lectureships Committee. I'm delighted to welcome our distinguished speaker, Professor Geoffrey Stout, who is Professor of Religion at Princeton University, as he continues his series on the theme of Religion Unbound, Ideals and Powers from Cicero to King. This evening, Professor Stout will deliver his second lecture entitled Early Modern Critique, Critics of Tyranny and Oppression. The lecture and question time this evening are being recorded and the video will shortly be available online on the university's Gifford Lectures web pages. I now have great pleasure in handing over to Professor Geoffrey Stout. In addition to thanking Professor Shaw, I also want to thank Andrew Johnson for uh, taking charge of the Gifford lectures blog and for writing a superb summary of my first lecture. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Religion talk is a parochial affair gone global. Religio had no exact semantic equivalent or analog outside Latin Christendom when the modern era began. Then missionaries, explorers, admirals, traders, soldiers, slavers, and settlers carried a value-laden discourse of religion with them on their imperial adventures overseas and used it to classify the peoples they uh, conquered and converted there. This discourse also gave rise to a scathing critique of the imperial project. Meantime, reformers back in Europe employing the same vocabulary, demanded political arrangements consistent with freedom, equality, and true religion, lives, liberties, and regimes on several continents hung in the balance. In this lecture, I shall be focusing on early modern Dominicans, mostly Bartolome de las Casas, a prolific critic of Spanish conduct in the Indies, I will also touch on Anton de Montesinos, who preached against the conquistadors before Las Casas did, and Girolamo Savonarola, who demanded sweeping reform of church and city in late 15th century Florence. Now, being Thomas by training, these friars regarded religion as a virtue to be contrasted with its semblance, its false look-alike, the vice of superstition. They regarded non-Christians, but many nominal Christians, too, as superstitious. What passed for Christianity in their own time had been corrupted by the vices of oppressive tyrants, among others. To qualify as true religion, the friars proclaimed, Christianity itself must be purified. What is an oppressive tyrant, according to the preaching friars? <clears throat> A tyrant exercises power over someone for reasons contrary to the common good, typically avarice. Tyrants are essentially ill-motivated and tend to be cruel. They are oppressive when they unjustly press a person or group into servitude. To be in servitude or subjected to domination is to be at the mercy of another's will, as a slave is vulnerable to a master's arbitrary power. A tyrant is not said to be a bad king, but a false king no king at all, because a king is defined as someone entitled to rule, someone who rules others for inherently unjust reasons is disqualified from the entitlement to rule 
and therefore not a king. Tyrants are guilty of sedition, defined as a species of inherently unjust behavior and therefore absolutely prohibited. Does this mean that resistance against a tyrant need not be seditious? Thomas doesn't say. He doesn't say what just resistance would look like or who would be entitled to carry it out, but these implicit questions are there between the lines for later figures to ponder. He is quite explicit on the importance of the role of clergy, bishops, members of his own order, in uh, holding rulers accountable. So the clergy in this context are playing an, an accountability role on Thomas's view that parallels the role of the Senate uh, in Republican Rome. Because our friars were responding to oppressive tyrants, they did not initially feel a need to discuss the possibility of non-tyrannical domination or to clarify the notions of domination and arbitrary power any further. We'll get there. As we get close to the end of this lecture, we'll see more interest in drawing these distinctions and thinking through the concepts further, and we'll see more progress with this uh, in later lectures. Las Casas was born in 1484 in Seville, where the first verdict of the Inquisition had been handed down three years earlier. The defendants in that trial were conversos, Jewish converts or their descendants charged with practicing Judaism secretly. Their penalty was to be burned at the stake. Las Casas was probably of converso descent. At the age of 18, he accompanied his father across the Atlantic to Española, where, like other uh, Spaniards there, he acquired an estate and slaves. When he joined a force led by Diego Velázquez to track down Indians who had taken flight from a massacre, Las Casas received a formal military title. Yet he also became a sort of priest who was permitted to acquire wealth while preaching to the natives. He was at once an encomendero, a conquistador, and a doctrinero. A handful of Dominican friars soon arrived in Santo Domingo from <coughs> Salamanca. They had received their training there in the, prior, in the priory of San Esteban. Diego de Deza, a follower of Thomas Aquinas, another Dominican, had recently reformed the, prior, uh, the priory curriculum. The friars were shocked, having arrived uh, in the New World, to find much of the Indian population uh, working under unbearable conditions in the mines and the cassava fields. While hearing confessions, the friars learned of massacres. After observing numerous horrors firsthand and spending months in prayer, the Dominicans decided to take a stand. This is only several months into their time uh, on the island. They jointly drafted a sermon, uh, and they assigned um, Fray Anton de Montesinos the task of delivering the sermon on the fourth Sunday of Advent in 1511. They chose him not because he was the leader of the group, but because he was the best speaker. Las Casas described these circumstances and quoted from the sermon in his History of the Indies. Montesinos accused his flock of tyranny and oppression and lamented that the Indians had been reduced to servitude. The conquistadors were tyrannous because their acts of murder, theft, and exploitation exhibited cruelty, greed, and disregard for the common good. 
The conquistadors were oppressive because they had unjustly forced many Indians into chains and reduced the rest to servitude. Why, Montesinos asked his congregation, would anyone mistreat potential converts rather than offering them proper religious instruction and access to the mass? And then come his famous words, are they not men? Do they not have rational souls? Are you not bound to love them as you love yourselves? How can you lie in such profound and lethargic slumber? Take this for certain. In the state you are in, you can no more save your souls than Moors or Turks who neither have Christian faith nor want it. The conquistadors insisted that they had acted in obedience to royal authority. The bulls of donation of 1493, uh, in those bulls of donation, the pope had granted authority over the conquered territories to the crowns of Castile and Aragon for the purpose of spreading the word of God. Private gain and glory were merited as rewards for the risks and sacrifices involved the conquistadors thought. So the charge of tyranny was baseless. The king himself had awarded the uh, uh, Indian slaves to his representatives in Española. While they had been pressed into servitude, this was both legitimate and good for them, good for the Indians. So they were not oppressed. Against such arguments and various threats, the Dominicans held firm. Meanwhile, controversy over the sermon reached uh, the Castilian court, and Las Casas joined another military expedition, this time to Cuba, doubling on that expedition uh, as an evangelist to the Indians and as a chaplain to the armed forces. Velazquez, in command of the expedition, ordered Las Casas to approach the nobles of Havana with a promise of peace. So try to imagine this scene. As the Indians dropped their guard when Las Casas approached them, Velazquez attacked. Las Casas recalled the ensuing atrocities, as he called them, as more terrible than any living man has ever seen nor ever thought to see. The inhabitants who did not escape or take their own lives and the lives of their children in despair, quote, were either enslaved or foully murdered. 3,000, quote, without the slightest provocation were butchered before my eyes. Most of those who were enslaved rather than murdered soon perished from hard labor. When he approached a Dominican prior to have his confession heard, Las Casas was told that as long as he retained his own slaves, he could not be forgiven. He did not yield to correction until he prepared a sermon of his own on the Feast of Pentecost in 1514. Expecting imperial officials to be present at, on this uh, occasion, he decided to reissue the call for repentance that Montesinos had issued uh, three years earlier. It would do little good, Las Casas realized, for him to preach what his own life failed to exemplify. So he gave up his slaves before preaching the sermon. This was a difficult decision for him because uh, he was under that, the system that was in place. He was not in a position to free the slaves. If they were no longer his slaves, they would be someone else's slaves. And he was pretty sure that that would mean that they would be treated worse. So you can see his dilemma, but he felt that uh, in order to preach this sermon, he could not be a slaveholder. In 1515, Las Casas returned to Spain to report the atrocities. Hoping to restore order to the Indies, 
the royal regents appointed three friars, Hieronymites, not Dominicans, to exercise sovereignty there and named Las Casas to the formal role of protector of the Indians. Las Casas became a novice in the Dominican order in 1522 and took his final vows as a Dominican uh, friar a year later. Still later, as uh, Bishop of Chiapas, he withheld forgiveness from unrepentant and commanderos and conquistadors as the Dominicans had once withheld it from him. In his 40 years as protector of the Indians, Las Casas continued to plead for imperial and religious reform to whatever officials would grant him a hearing, church officials, governmental officials. He documented imperial injustices, gathered evidence of Amerindian practices, very extensive evidence indeed, and studied classical and Christian texts in order to improve his ability to make his case to the officials. After becoming a Dominican, he leaned more and more heavily on Thomism and on canon law, as taught at Salamanca. Yet back in 1515, so not long after he preached that sermon, he had shamefully proposed that African slaves be substituted for Indians in hard labor. The protector of the Indians was a malefactor to the Africans and a willful oppressor, even while trying to undo a particular instance of oppression. <coughs> that is why David Walker, in his 1829 appeal to the colored citizens of the world, denounced Las Casas as a, quote, wretch, a defiler of true religion, and an oppressor motivated by sordid avarice only. Well, Walker was wrong about the avarice, but he was right about the proposal, which Las Casas himself came to regret. The gravity of his sin, he said later, made him uh, shudder at the thought of hellfire. Many critics of defiled religion are also offenders as we ourselves might be in relation to other victims now. <coughs> Tyranny exercises power over someone for reasons at odds with willing the common good. Velazquez and other conquistadors were tyrannous, according to Las Casas, because their rule was demonstrably avaricious also thieving, exploitative, cruel, and murderous. But what does this have to do with, with religion? For a Thomist, religion is a part of justice, as I uh, explained last time, and it's therefore essentially oriented toward the common good. Thus, true religion and tyranny are inherently at odds. This claim is correct, Las Casas thought, but also somewhat abstract. He wanted to show more concretely how imperial tyranny undermines true religion. His arguments combine an Augustinian diagnosis of idolatry with a humanist contrast between persuasion and war. So first, the Augustinian uh, diagnosis of idolatry. Spreading the gospel of the true religion is an act of true religion, an expression of virtuous devotion to God. Motives other than a purified desire to win the free assent of potential converts corrupt the underlying virtue itself. Religion is itself at risk when a mission of evangelization is mixed up with tyranny. Tyranny employs force on behalf of private gain. The motive of private gain is greed. This motive is irreligious because it tends toward idolatry, a species of superstition. 
whenever love of money, gold, or glory takes the place of love of God at the center of one's life or mission, idolatry is the result. Christian religion ceases to be religious virtue in this Thomistic worldview when corrupted by lust, uh, lust for gold and lust for glory. Well, so goes the Augustinian diagnosis. The humanist point about rhetoric is as follows. Evangelical persuasion is inherently at odds with forcing people into submission. Persuasion appeals to human beings by attracting and exhorting them toward goodness and truth. This point holds whether the person being addressed is a Christian prince or a potential convert to Christianity. Somehow a friar armed only with words had to persuade Christian holders of great coercive power to make their policies conform to wisdom, benevolence, and justice. Otherwise, Christian evangelists would be unable to persuade Indians to accept Christian religion. So there's a double act of persuasion that the friar has to engage in. The tyrannical exercise of coercive power, Las Casas argues, makes the work of free rational persuasion difficult or impossible. In the surviving fragments of Las Casas's first major work, which is called The Only Way of Calling All People to the True Religion, his argument for confining Evangelism to peaceable means turns on a contrast between rhetoric and force. Am I on the right slide here? That's where we should be. That's better. True religion is Christian religion, on his view, the virtue and practice of true Christians serving the true God rightly. The evangelist preaches true religion, the authentic virtue, to potential converts by gently persuading them to adopt the practices of proper worship and devotion. The practices inculcate virtuous habits. Human beings, even in their sinful condition, are by nature rational creatures, according uh, to Las Casas. As such, they are susceptible to rational persuasion and virtuous habituation. Rational assent to truth and virtuous conduct is given freely when not given under pressure of bribes, threats, or subjection. For Las Casas, as for many Renaissance writers, rhetoric is the vehicle of civilizing progress in any human society. And in the only way, this first book of his and several later works, Las Casas cites Cicero's example of a leader whose persuasive speech had turned savages into kind and gentle human beings capable of civilized governance. So Las Casas' reason, reasoning from that example goes like this. If sound Christian preaching is assisted by divine grace and serves theological as well as political goods. Its capacity to transform even the least civilized audience must far exceed that of the most eloquent pagan. So if Cicero was right about somebody being able to persuade people, think of what the Christians could do. Rational persuasion and coercion are, according to Las Casas, distinct ways of treating human beings. Coercion is needed to establish and maintain a just society, not least by holding Christians, including converts, to their freely undertaken promises. It is, however, for a Thomist, no way to spread the gospel. So there's a distinction here between how you treat people who've already promised to behave as Christians and people who haven't. So you can hold the people who've already promised 
to their promises by using coercive force. That's not, however, how you bring people into the fold in the first place. Okay. A preacher gently moves a potential convert's will toward the good by presenting Christ, the gospel, and Christian religion to the listener's understanding as good. Las Casas never doubts for a moment that conversion of the Indians would be good for them and essential for their salvation. But he holds that only when potential converts are approached in the right way can they assent freely to the Christian faith or to worshiping as Christians do. Only by means of persuasion will the Indians come freely to worship the God Las Casas worships, do so in the right manner, and with the help of divine grace, believe what he believes. The preacher must therefore make evident in his actions that he has no desire for riches. This is why Dominicans take a vow of poverty. Voluntary poverty belongs here to an ethics and rhetoric of exemplarity of example setting. It uses sacrifice to clarify what is being preached and to, and to clarify the ethos of the preacher, the character of the preacher. A preacher must show himself to be humble, good-willed, charitable, holy, and just. It's not good enough just to be those things. You must show yourself to be those things this is part of the persuasive act. To do this is to become, quote, a living example, a life visibly virtuous, as Las Casas puts it. And he cites 2 Thessalonians 3.7 on the importance of offering others an example to imitate. And then he quotes Anselm. We must set the example so those who want to follow the right way should walk the path we do. The same point applies to political leaders, as I uh, implied yesterday in my response to George's question about uh, President Obama. Justice is the virtue according to which each person receives his or her due and not the opposite, uh, Las Casas says. Christian charity and justice rule out the idea that, quote, pagans should first be subjected, whether they wish to be or not, to the rule of Christian people, and only then exposed to Christian preaching. This was the counter strategy proposed by the conquistadors. Subjection of a distant people can only be achieved through war. Quote, but if pagans find themselves first injured, oppressed, saddened, and afflicted by the misfortunes of wars through the loss of their children, their goods, and their own liberty, how can they be moved voluntarily to listen to what is proposed to them about faith, religion, justice, and truth? End of quote. Tyranny tends toward oppression because greed feeds the desire to dominate. But none of these evils is compatible with the, du with the duty that true religion imposes on Christians uh, to preach the gospel. No less indebted to Renaissance interest in rhetoric than the only way was the work for which Las Casas is best known, A Short Account of the Destruction of the Indies, which was published originally in 1552. This uh, slide gives a, a 16th century um, uh, picture of one of the atrocities. So in one of the European editions of this work, uh, this engraved image appeared. There are many others equally ghastly. Its prologue directly addresses King Charles V of Castile, also Holy Roman Emperor, 
for he above all had to be persuaded to take action. So this is in effect part of the advice to princes genre that goes back to Seneca's De Clementia. Las Casas begins by affirming royal authority and virtue. Monarchy is the providentially ordained mode of government. Kings are the most noble and generous members of commonwealths, he says. Grave injustices transpire under a king only if he is unaware of them. Well, these claims sound as if they could be empty flattery, but let's think back to how the terminology is defined by Thomas. Las Casas certainly intended to evoke benevolence from Charles V, but as I said earlier, calling someone a king in this Thomistic idiom assumes that person to be the rightful holder of an office. A ruler who acquires office illi illicitly or exploits his subjects for the sake of private gain or knowingly permits underlings to commit murder and theft is a tyrant, not a king. That's why it follows from the definitions that a king is uh, a, a, a highly virtuous member of the Commonwealth. The real question being posed implicitly is whether Charles V is a king or a tyrant. Las Casas hopes that Charles V is a king. Tyr tyrannous acts have been committed in his name. He proposes to demonstrate this. To prove that he is a king, Las Casas, uh, or uh, to, for Charles V to prove that he is a king, he, Charles V, must bring such acts to a halt and hold the guilty parties accountable. If he is not truly a king, this attempt to persuade him will fail because his heart is corrupted. The account needs to be brief, brevissima, because a king who is also an emperor does not have much time for books. When I first wrote that, I did not have Trump in mind. <laughs> the appeal consists, in this case, in a series of examples of horrendous injustice. All the way, or running all the way through my lectures will be the theme, the rhetorical theme of example. So we've already seen that in one way, in Las Casas' thinking of himself as a living example, preaching what that implies in terms of his own conduct. Um, now we're dealing with another sort of example, examples of horrendous injustice. Las Casas explains that he is able to include only a few of innumerable examples. This is uh, a theme uh, touched on last time briefly in our discussion. So he's able to include only a few of the innumerable examples and later in the book, he interrupts the narratives more than once to remark on the copiousness of the examples from which he is drawing his sample. In De Copia of 1512, Erasmus, and Las Casas was within a circle of influence tied in with Erasmus, Erasmus had emphasized the importance of selecting the most striking examples from an abundance of material and adapting them to a pattern of one's choosing. So how you make a speech is all about culling examples from an abundance of examples and arranging them so that the striking ones will make the impression required. Okay? So here he is thinking about this in light of, probably in light of Erasmus's reflections on this topic. The examples assembled by Las Casas crash on the reader like waves, one after another, each narrated in the grand style so as to achieve maximally forceful moral impact. 
The two rhetorical purposes were to inform the king insofar as he was ignorant of the injustices being done in his name and to move him so that he would be willing to act in light of the truths being made known to him. The second purpose explains the friar's use of the grand style. Las Casas understood that his examples were both of great importance and likely to evoke tearful passion. These are two marks of the grand style, according to Augustine. The early pages of a short account employ a diction reminiscent of Longinus with references to the marvelous, the extraordinary, the enormous, the incredible, the ecstatic, the shocking, the horrible, the abominable, the wicked, and the calamitous. That's all basic, uh, the basic vocabulary of the sublime. And it, in, it uh, uh, the sublime is intimately connected with the imminence of danger and the, the, the danger of death in particular. As the examples are set out in the remainder of the book, Las Casas often refers to tyranny when specifying the injustices uh, of the Spanish Empire. And in his chapter on the Yucatan, he makes seven references to tyranny immediately before shifting into an ironic tone and asking his reader to consider, quote, the religion and examples of the Christianity the Spaniards uh, brought with them to the Indies. He then asks, uh, how have they honored God and worshiped uh, and what they care uh, uh, and what care they have taken to sow and grow and expand the holy faith? His implication is that they've taken no care at all. He concludes his chapter on uh, Florida by referring again ironically to the, quote, law and religion uh, that the Spanish profess and boast to be immaculate. The irony implies that the Spaniards have on the whole exhibited irreligion, not religion, to the Indians. Doing that was the opposite of evangelizing. By exemplifying idolatry, the Spaniards were giving the Indians reason to regard Christianity as vicious and thus as unworthy of their assent. The remedy for superstition in all its forms, according to Las Casas, is true religion, as he conceives of it, of course. He differentiates distinct sources of error and distinct stages of progress toward perfection. Moral virtues are human excellences and come in degrees in contexts where Las Casas applies the highest standard of religious excellence. He uses the term religion or the phrase true religion to designate that. Employing that standard, he sometimes refers to someone or something simply as irreligious. That's the term Las Casas uses to characterize what his opponents had written about the Indians. He accuses his opponents of being irreligious. Those writings are irreligious because they conflate an act of religion, namely preaching the gospel, with conquest. Worse, they permit the tyranny and greed of a particular conquest to vitiate the practice of religion and infect the souls of baptized Christians. Las Casas often explains a flaw in Indian religious conduct, a flaw as he understands it, by attributing a species of superstition to someone thereby identifying something particular in that person that's in need of change. When he attributes idolatry to Indians who have not yet heard the gospel or who understandably associated it with tyranny and oppression, he is careful to excuse the Indians from blame 
insofar as non-culpable ignorance, as he puts it, diminishes the freedom of the act. Classifying someone as idolatrous expresses a negative judgment, but not necessarily, in his way of speaking, an assignment of blame. Consider a parallel case regarding filial piety, in which a person kidnapped at the age of two comes to honor and love his kidnapper as his father. Such a person is not rightly related to his actual father, and his kidnapper does not deserve the honor and love being given uh, to him. The victim is not to blame for getting these things wrong. There is even something praiseworthy in his attitudes and behavior toward the man he wrongly takes to be his father. The passions and actions of the kidnapped of the kidnapping victim exhibit an inclination children naturally have toward their loving parents. We can imagine the victim's true father observing his son's life from a distance, wanting him to know the truth, desiring reconciliation with him, and even admiring what his expressions of filial honor and love reveal about him, even though they're directed at the wrong person, the person who has victimized him. So by the same token, because Indian idolatry remains rooted in and is expressive of the natural inclination to know and love God, according to uh, Las Casas, it can exhibit a sort of excellence despite being ill-directed and inappropriate relative to the true standard. Idolatry cannot achieve knowledge of God as he actually is, express love of that God, or give the true God the honor he is due. All of this from Las Casas's point of view. The idolater's life, therefore, remains deficient in important ways, he is confused about God's identity. His relationship to God would benefit from further mending. But where idolatry, quote, proceeds from ignorance about the true God and divine things, unquote, it need not, quote, have the character of a sin, unquote. This is an important point Las Casas thinks for an evangelist to keep in mind when approaching the Indians and equally important for their protector, their official protector, to impress upon uh, officials in Spain. What requires correction in the Indian idolater who has not heard the gospel is primarily ignorance of the gospel. What requires correction in the Indian idolater who has recoiled from so-called Christians because of their tyrannical behavior is a misimpression of the gospel, a misimpression caused by the irreligion of baptized Christians. What the most respectable Indian idolaters do, whether it be offering first fruits in Cuba or, and he's quite explicit on this, or engaging in human sacrifice in Peru is to be explained charitably as an honest but flawed attempt to meet a demand of natural law. This is Las Casas' view. Now, we shift ground a little bit. If true religion is compatible uh, with achieving liberty, what is liberty? Las Casas appears to have had two traditions in mind when discussing liberty. One of these is monarchist and is indebted to Seneca's claim that subjects are free just in case uh, the body politic is ruled by and its subjects are obedient to a virtuous prince. So you're free if you are the obedient subject of a virtuous prince. That's the Senecan view. 
But Las Casas was also aware of, a, of Roman Republican writings, Cicero and others, according to which liberty is security from servitude, from domination. Servitude is a condition of vulnerability to arbitrary power. Oppression is a kind of action or activity that presses someone unjustly into servitude or holds them there. An important Republican distinction became increasingly salient as Las Casas continued to press his case against oppressive tyranny. You can lack liberty in the sense of being excessively vulnerable to someone else's arbitrary power, even if the person or group holding the power over you wishes you well and takes your well-being into account when deciding your fate. This had been Cicero's reason for taking monarchies to be essentially at odds with liberty. He means absolute monarchies. So this was Cicero's reason for taking monarchies to be essentially at odds with liberty and for repeatedly depicting the assassination of Caesar as a just act of resistance. To my knowledge, Las Casas never openly challenged the legitimacy of monarchy, but Cicero's conception of liberty exerted a strong attraction on him, and I will now try to explain why that was so. If you have a master as benevolent as Las Casas claims to have been to his slaves, you're still a slave, a point I made in the Q&A yesterday. You might be well fed, you might be permitted to do many things. These benefits will depend, however, on someone else's will. So long as you are vulnerable to arbitrary power, to just what this other person's will, whatever that will happens to be, your life and well-being depend on someone else's benevolence toward you. So you have an adequate say or no say, you are at someone's mercy. So you're dependent on their benevolence. You're dependent on their benevolence remaining steady. You're vulnerable to perturbations in their will. You lack liberty, you are dominated. Whenever someone is in a position to mistreat you at whim, in a position to mistreat you at whim, when you lack adequate protection against ill will or adequate protection against changes in the will of those with power over you. That is why, Las Casas eventually realizes, why African slaves should not be substituted for the Indian slaves. The crucial question for David Walker and for Lord Gifford's abolitionist heroes, Clarkson and Wilberforce, was not whether the masters are benevolent, but whether any people should be utterly dependent on someone else's benevolence. If you are dependent on a benevolent master, you have every reason to desire protection from changes in his will or ill-informed acts motivated by his benevolence. Such protection is lacking if the power imbalance is so great that the master could exercise power over you at whim, that is, arbitrarily. Savonarola had already confronted similar issues in the 1490s in Florence. 
Lorenzo the Magnificent and his successor, Piero de' Medici, were obviously ruling for the sake of private gain and without goodwill for all of the people under their power. The Medici rulers were not benevolent from Savonarola's point of view. They violated the Senecan ideal of the virtuous prince. They were insufficiently concerned with the common good, hence they were tyrants. A mixture of avarice and lust for domination turned them into oppressors, too, as they willfully deprived their subjects of political powers. The greater the resulting power imbalance, the easier it was for the Medici rulers to act arbitrarily and to have their way. If a benevolent prince replaced these tyrants, his subjects would be better off. But if the power imbalance were not also corrected, those subjects would still be in servitude, subject to another's arbitrary power and dependent on his benevolence. They would lack protection against changes in his will. They would lack the standing and powers that citizens have in a republic to consent to being governed and by assembling and expressing themselves freely in public to influence and contest governmental decisions. In short, they would lack liberty in Cicero's sense, not Seneca's. Liberty, Savonarola believed, was a good especially fitting for Florence. Florence had had a republic before. There was a tradition of caring about liberty uh, that Savonarola thought was especially robust in this place. So when his sermons undermined Florentine deference to Medici tyranny in 1494, he proposed a republican government there. That means uh, a government in which the central uh, political body was a grand council that had representatives from various groups in the city. He did not take the additional step later taken by Milton, which we'll get to in a later lecture, of concluding that only a free republic can be counted as a legitimate government. But suppose Republican liberty is good for Florence, why wouldn't it also be good for Siena or for Rome? Why wouldn't it be a requirement of justice in Castile and Aragon? These questions are lurking between the lines of these works. Now, as protector of the Indians, Las Casas was entitled to influence and contest imperial policies. But let's think about this role as we switch back to Las Casas now. Let's think about this role a little bit, protector of the Indians. He was entitled to influence and contest governmental decisions as long as he held the role, okay? As long as the role existed. But his holding the role was a matter of the will of the officials, right? And the role's existence was also a factor, a product of the will of those officials. So he was not entitled to exercise any degree of control over what the policies were or how they would be carried out. He felt increasingly powerless over this. The privilege of his office, which could be revoked at any time, was access to princely and ecclesial decision makers, his superiors. He was, in effect, a friend of the court, representing uh, the interests of parties who, who, though not officially entitled to a say, were obviously affected by imperial policies and conduct, the Indians. Las Casas served as protector at the pleasure of the highest officials he was addressing. His role, as well as his appointment to it, depended on official goodwill. To retain the role, he needed to elicit that benevolence while appealing to it. And this goes back to the question of whether those opening passages of uh, 
of the short account uh, are flattery. An increasing concern in this period is over the, the institutional conditions under which the vice of flattery uh, takes hold in a political culture. When you are subservient to arbitrary power, you have an interest in maintaining the powerful as a benevolent will. And you become servile, you flatter them, you adopt uh, vicious habits, this is a problem. Well, to retain the role, Las Casas needed to elicit the benevolence while appealing to it. His task was to represent Indian interests. He did not act as an agent of the Indians, for they had not chosen him to represent them. Okay. They had no standing in these courts, nor any means of holding their protector accountable. He operated without their consent, as a guardian does in relation to young children. If he misrepresented the Indians, they would never know. If his arguments failed to persuade the makers and enforcers of policy, there was no further recourse. Las Casas grew uneasy with playing such a paternalist role. You can see why. He eventually concluded that because Spanish rule over the Indies did not rest on the consent of the natives, their political liberty had been violated. And that's liberty in Cicero's sense. To buttress the charge of oppression first voiced by Montesinos, Las Casas argued that if a ruler exercises power over you without your consent, you are in a condition of servitude. A ruler who places you in that position or keeps you there oppresses you unless there is a good reason for the, unless there is a good reason, a sufficient reason for the power imbalance. A desire for private gain is a tyrant's motive and tends toward oppression. A ruler who serves only his own interest is apt to maximize his own power while minimizing the say of others. In his defense of the requirement of Indian consent, Las Casas appealed to a provision that Boniface had added to canon law in 1298 namely that what touches all must be approved by all, known to scholars by the Latin abbreviation QOT. If I may briefly follow up yesterday's exchange with Professor Torrance, QOT was originally a provision of private law in the Justinian Digest. And you can see how potentially radical a move it is to apply QOT not just to cases involving private contracts, but now to public governance. This is a very important move in Western intellectual political history, uh, this move to include this line, to take it from one context and put it into another. So already in the 12th century, commonwealths were expanding practices of consultation and accountability in response to concerns about consent and representation. It's important to keep in mind that the Dominicans as an order had councils built into their own constitution, so they differ significantly from the Franciscans in this respect. By the 14th century, QOT was being cited as a reason for such reforms, but interpretation of the principle was far from settled at the moment that Las Casas appealed to it. If we go a, a, a bit further, historically, by the time we get to someone like Althusius and other covenantal theorists in the 16th and 17th centuries, not least of all in Scotland, uh, QOT became a premise in Ciceronian arguments for strengthening accountability 
as a remedy for um, power imbalances, the power imbalances, the structural defects um, called domination. The prohibition of tyranny entails that Spanish decision makers must take the well-being of the Indians into account. QOT seems to require much more than that. First, that government be instituted by the consent of the governed, and second, that the Indians be given suitable opportunities to influence and contest particular decisions that affected them that they choose their own representatives to do that, not to have one assigned as protector. The term aprobari appears to imply the need for actual approval at both levels, and you can see where we are headed. Well, what could be a reason, a good reason for rulers to deny their subjects an effective say in what happens to them? The reason typically given is paternalist, that the resulting power imbalance is required in order to serve the good of the subjected party. Paternalists often grant that some people are capable of consenting to their governors and holding them accountable by peaceful means. The claim is that persons who lack maturity, intelligence, or virtue should be excluded from those roles for their own sake and for the sake of the common good. Race theory, patriarchy, royalism, theocracy, oligarchy, and imperialism are all variations on this paternalist claim. They have all appeared, uh, appealed to true religion in defense of paternalism, while their religious opponents have responded with imminent criticism, diagnose, diagnoses of error, and calls to purify corrupted religion. Las Casas was responding to the imperial claim that because the Indians were supposedly incapable of self-government, the Spaniard, Spaniards were entitled to rule the Indians without their consent or participation. Uh, the humanist Sepulveda was assigned the task of debating Las Casas before a learned jury. The debate took place uh, under the aegis of King Charles V in 1550. Sepulveda cited the court-appointed historian Oviedo in support of the claim that, quote, people of this kind, that is the Indians, are bound by natural law to submit to the control of those who are wiser and superior in virtue, of, in virtue and in learning, as are the Spaniards." End of quote. If the Indians do not consent, they may, quote, be forced to do so for their own welfare by recourse to the terrors of war. The claim that the Indians are, quote, of such a character that they are to be governed by the will of others, unquote, alludes to Aristotle's uh, category of natural slaves. In a general history of the Indies, Oviedo had described the Indians as either childlike or vicious, implying that either way their consent to dominion was not required. Childlike subjects lack the maturity to consent to their rulers, whereas vicious subjects, by acting in character, sacrifice a right to consent that they would otherwise retain. Children are affected by the decisions of their parents, but not entitled to approve either those decisions or the power of their parent, that their parents hold over them. Parents are permitted, but not obligated, to consult their young children or to provide them with opportunities to express their grievances. Parents are obligated simply to exercise authority wisely over a young child for the good of the child and the family as a whole. If one accepts the analogy, the issue comes down to what forms of consultation and accountability a wise and benevolent monarch 
will extend to such subjects. The monarch's authority over childlike subjects depends solely on the monarch's goodwill, according to the paternalist argument. That is, on his avoidance of tyranny. It has nothing to do with the structural pow power imbalance. So for paternalists, there's no question of oppression or domination here to be raised. Las Casas argued, and I'm nearing my conclusion, that Oviedo's depiction of the Indians was both false and contagious, a word we have found Lord Gifford using. Las Casas accepted the category of natural slaves, but not the propriety of applying it to the Indians as a group. Having lived among the Indians, he had found them capable of attaining maturity and virtue. He wasn't so sure at first about Africans. Natural slaves are human beings who, as adults, lack the capacities and virtues required for giving rational consent to their governors and for participating in governmental practices. Because the Indians had done such things before the conquest, they were obviously not natural slaves, according to Las Casas. After the conquest, many Indians, given the freedom to convert after hearing the gospel, became responsible subjects. So Oviedo's portrait of the Indians was demonstrably false, according to Las Casas. He repeatedly conceded the Pope's authority to donate the Indian territories to the crowns of Castile and Aragon. The protector of the Indians served at his superior's pleasure. Savonarola was also at the mercy of his Vatican superiors. When he challenged their authority directly, he and two of his associates were hanged and burned in the public, uh, the principal public square of Florence. His torturers had forced him to say that he had never been divinely inspired. Elsewhere in Europe, concerns about oppression, domination, servitude, and liberty came increasingly to the fore among Rom Roman Catholics and Protestants alike. And I have focused on Dominicans in part in this lecture to demonstrate that the conflicts of this period were not simply products of the Protestant Reformation and warfare between Protestants and Roman Catholics. Tectonic shifts were creating a new discursive terrain, the ground on which Milton rejected monarchy as such, Wollstonecraft rejected patriarchy as such, Lord Gifford rejected chattel slavery as such, Gandhi rejected imperialism as such, and King rejected white supremacy as such, all in the name of conscience and virtuous religion. These relationships are all inherently dominating. They are unjust even when the dominant party is benevolent. The dominant often bid us to bow piously in their direction, acknowledging our childlike dependence on the benevolence of fathers, masters, husbands, emperors, whites, policemen, and job creators. The paternalist semblances of true science, true history, true philosophy, true art, and true religion need unmasking and correction. The worst things are the corruptions of the best things. Vice wears virtue's mask to the conquistador's ball and bends its knee in the, oppressor, in the oppressor's court. Religion must renounce oppression as well as tyranny if it is to be the virtue it purports to be. So said Las Casas when condemning Velazquez. So said David Walker when condemning Las Casas. So said Savonarola when denouncing Lorenzo. And so said the post-colonial American who in a brother's voice, not a father's, called the future Lord Gifford out of complicity. Thank you very much.
Um, you mentioned this idea that uh, it should be persuasion rather than coercion t uh, to be the method to approach potential con converts. Um, and I'm wondering if Las Casas said anything about where the tipping point is at which you no longer require to use persuasion and you can start using, uh, or holding people to their promises, as, as you put it, uh, as opposed to gentle persuasion if you, you, are, um, if you think that they're not uh, following the, the religion as required. So uh, he, is, he is drawing on a tradition that goes back to Augustine, perhaps earlier, according to which coercion may be used in order to get baptized Christians to keep their promises. In other words, coercion may be used against heretics. Heresy is, is uh, a sin you can be guilty of only after first um, becoming a Christian and becoming baptized. According to Augustine, coercion may be used to bring those people back into the fold. And then once they're back into the fold, persuasion can be uh, can have its effects again. What it must, what coercion must not be used to do, is to bring someone into the faith. That's the arg That's the that's the basic distinction. Now I'm not sure which which tipping point you are concerned with. It's baptism. Is it is it baptism that yes. makes that distinction? Yes. Um, and what happens if that was not uh, in uh, consented to freely? Well, I, uh, in, um, I, I'm not sure I can remember a passage in which uh, Las Casas addressed that directly, but it seems to follow from his other arguments that if the liberty of the person had been violated at the point of conversion, the uh, the freedom of the act was was not there, so the, liber the that person's liberty had been violated. Okay, further questions. You you can't hold somebody to a promise that was made, um, that was that was made in in the wrong way under the wrong circumstances. That down here. Sorry, I did say I'll have you up and down those steps, Anna. I, I meant it. Andrew, is this an, a question from an online oh, contributor? This is my own question. No, this is your question. Um, in this lecture, you highlighted the incompatibility of liberty with servitude to arbitrary power. Uh, I'm wondering if you might further articulate and differentiate this uh, relationship from liberty's relationship to piety, understood as a proper acknowledgement of various asymmetrical relations of dependence. So, in other words, how does proper freedom relate to a recognition of proper dependence? Right. Well, you can see um, that there, uh, part of what I am implicitly so far drawing attention to is the relation, the troubled relation between the notion that religion is a virtue, like, pi like piety is a, is a virtue of acknowledged dependence. And almost all of the writers that I will talk about in this lecture series conceive of religion in that way. But they also think that religion is a politically consequential virtue, and they are divided over the issue of how the relevant forms of dependency and the virtuous acknowledgement of it should be conceived. So on the one hand, we have, uh, if we can imagine a spectrum here, we have figures who take the order of being to be a matter of the individual subject, political subject, being dependent on first his or her parents, then people, 
right, than God or the gods in the classical tradition. And that this chain of being, so to speak, um, requires mere deference to each higher level um, in the hierarchical arrangement of being. Okay. And then a paternalist justification of monarchy uh, can be formulated in those terms and claim to be the only way that religion as a virtue can be properly conceived. Okay. It is against that view that most of the people I will be talking about in the remainder of the lecture series are tilting. They want to argue that it is it is a properly conceived form of piety or religion to acknowledge your, the sources of your existence and progress through life without thereby becoming unfree in the Ciceronian sense. And that requires on their view, on Milton's view, for example, um, another virtue in addition to religion, in addition to piety, which is an appropriate form of self-trust. Self-reliance, self-trust, and religion and piety properly conceived must be viewed as compatible according to this tradition. So there we have Milton, there we have Emerson, uh, and carrying forward to King's letter from uh, Birmingham jail where he, and to his 1954 sermon on nonconformity, um, all of this is going to play out in the remainder of the series. But it's, you've got your, Andrew, you've gotten your finger right on the conceptual um, matrix uh, that the, uh, the debate I'm trying to explicate is all about. Two conceptions of religion and piety and an attempt to reconceive these virtues in a way that makes them compatible with an appropriate form of self-reliance. So then the question becomes, what's self-reliance and how can that go together with an appropriate acknowledgement of dependency? Well, that's, the, that's the, the nub of it. I think we have time for just one more question, if there's another question from elsewhere in the audience. Yeah, over there. You alluded, uh, I was wondering what the evidence was that um, Las Casas was not of um, pure blood in the uh, Spanish Catholic sense, and what significance that you attributed, if any, to, to, to such a, a heritage? Well, I, uh, uh, I'm not sure what the, uh, there I'm depending on his biographers. I. I, uh, I didn't, I, and I, uh, so I'm not sure uh, exactly what has led his biographers to, um, to say that he was, and they're always very cautious about this, to say that he was probably of converso descent. Um, there's a fairly high likelihood for him to be uh, of converso consent just to be from his neighborhood in Seville. But there's probably more evidence than that. Um, if, and uh, I don't think it takes uh, too many links to get to known conversos uh, in uh, Las Casas' family tree. What significance do I attach to this? Um, I brought this up in part to 
suggest why he might have been especially sensitive to issues surrounding um, uh, forced conversion and such. Uh, that, so the, the issues involving the, uh, the treatment of the Moors, the timing of the expulsion of the Moors and all of this in relation to Columbus's first um, uh, voyage it's very interesting also to just to look at Columbus's uh, log um, with its uh, in the early prefatory pages, its discussion of the um, uh, the uh, the triumph over the Moors and so on, and how he then links this to uh, he's also aware of the uh, of the um, uh, the new measures taken against Jews under the same circumstances, and all of this is connected in his mind to the evangelical mission uh, that he's been sent on to the New World. All of this is in the mix, and it's important to see that when Las Casas, a few years later, travels with his father on his father's second voyage to the, uh, to the New World, that um, all of these religious issues and the issues pertaining to oppression and uh, forced conversion and use of co coercion uh, are on his mind. They couldn't but be on his mind coming from Seville when he came from, Se when he came from there. Well, thank you very much, um, Professor Staub, for a, a wonderful lecture and um, also your, your answers to questions. You've opened a, a, a window for, uh, for many of us into understanding both some historical particularities about the relationship between religion and politics, but also a much bigger, if you will, uh, more, I, I hesitate to use the word universalistic because I'm sure that's not the right word to use, but a, a bigger picture about how these connections are made across time and, and space and across different types of struggles against uh, domination. So uh, perhaps we could just thank you once more for your wonderful lecture and your responses to questions. Thank you.